Here's the point I'm making. Not until extremely recent days, literally not until the 1940s, were people ever able to eat grain that hadn't gone through a, a light fermentation process. Today, today, all of that that I described has get, been compressed into a reciprocating knife, like a hedge trimmer. Now, some they're, they're great big. Some of them are, you know, 30 feet wide. You know, you see these great big combines. Um, and and the, the whole plant comes into a, um, a, a combine which has beaters that beat the heads, fans that blow the chaff back out on the field, and the grain then falls into a conveyor, which, which augurs it then into a hopper on the combine. Hello, welcome to Beyond Labels. I'm Dr. Sina McCullough, and I'm here with our favorite farmer, Joel Salatin. Now, many of you know that Joel is our guru in agricultural history, and not only in the historical perspective, but how that affects the nutrition and nutritive qualities of the food that we consume today. So today we have a special treat. Joel is gonna walk us through how modern handling of grain has changed the nutrition of the grain between the field and your plate. Yeah, well, welcome everybody. A little bit of a history lesson. So uh, most of us, when we think about harvesting grain, we imagine those, you know, National Geographic graphic pictures of great big combines, you know, going through a field. Well, uh, so a combine, the reason that we call it a combine is because it combines the mowing of the seed head with the, um, with the threshing of the seed itself. But those, those two practices didn't used to happen anywhere close to the same time. So let's back up to the way all of our ancestors uh, handled grain. So, so we're talking about grain. We're talking about uh, small grain like barley, rye, wheat, oats, those kinds of things. Um, spelt, amaranth, whatever. All right. So, what you have is you have a, you have a plant looks like it looks like a you know a big uh, stalk of grass, but it makes this heavy seed out on the top of it, and and that seed then is encased in a husk. And so our ancestors, without a mowing machine, they had a scythe. So a scythe was simply a, a blade that you swung, you know, um, with your, it, 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 if you're wondering how to spell it, it looks like skithy. All right. So it's S-C-Y-T-H-E, pronounced scythe. And we, you know, we don't, we don't use the term very much anymore because, well, nobody, very few people use a scythe. But um, you know, now, now today we tend to use you know weed eaters and 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 uh, you know things like that. But a scythe was a handheld uh, sickle that you that you mowed. So what you had to do, you couldn't go along and and clip off these seed heads. You couldn't you know just clip them off. You had to actually scythe the whole plant down. Um, because remember. The great invention that Cyrus McCormick came made to the world in 1837 in his blacksmith shop was the reciprocating the reciprocating mower, and uh, in other words, where you had two uh, where you had a, a blade between teeth and and a, and a, and uh, blades that reciprocated, and so these stems could go in there and it could. Click, 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 you know, and, and, and cut like, like a hedge trimmer. Imagine a hedge trimmer. Okay. So that was, that was Cyrus McCormick's invention before then everything had to be cut by hand with a scythe. All right. So you're in the field, you're, you're, you're cutting barley or oats or wheat or whatever with this scythe and it's, it's laying it down behind you. So um, eventually they made a cradle. They made a cradle on the scythe where every swing, whatever was cut in that swing would rest on the scythe and not just fall on the ground. That was a huge development. Uh, that development happened, you know, several hundred years ago. And, and that, that 
speeded up the chance. In other words, in, in biblical times, you simply mowed it, and then somebody came along behind and had to actually hand hand rake hand rake these stalks. Now, the thing was, when the grain was ready, of course, it was it had turned brown. It was no longer green. It was it was uh, starting to dry down. But the 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 seeds, the actual grains, were encased in a husk, uh, a a you know a, a skin a, a paper skin that that went over the seed head. You didn't want to handle it. You wanted to handle it very very gently, because if you um, if you handled it violently or aggressively, that seed head would shatter and the seed would fall out on the ground and you couldn't pick it up off the ground. So everything was real gentle. So you wanted to cut it gently. You wanted to rake it gently. And what you did then, that because that seed head was in a husk, it was moist because the husk was like a blanket or like a sheet on the on the grain on the the kernel of grain and wouldn't let it dry out so even though like the stock is you said it's brown it's yeah. dropped down that you're yeah. saying that seed part is still moist it's that's enclosed correct. in that blanket that's correct it's enclosed in that in that blanket um obviously it's a, it's a very thin blanket it's just a little you know skin a paper a paper thin skin but that's enough to hold some moisture in that seed head. Well, if you if you put a bunch of those seed heads together, um, they'll they'll mold. They'll just they'll just mold and and um, go to nothing. And so, what they would do is then they would gather up these stems, the stalk of the grain, and they would set it back on the ground. So now it's cut. So the plant is really dead, dead now, okay? There's no capillary action. There's no moisture going to the plant. They would actually then uh, take handfuls of this and set it back on the ground on the stems with the seed heads up, and, and the sun would come along and start to dry down those seed heads in, in their little skin. And as that as that happened, of course, you know, in the evening, dew would come up and the dew would make it wet again. Then the sun would come out and it would dry them down. And then the dew would come up and it would, and and there was always, a, a you know, usually days, um, if not a couple of weeks, but usually at least m multiple days between when, a, when the grain was put in a shock, that's why we call it a shock. That that's this this like TP TP standing up, and when that was actually gathered to go to thresh it, and all of this this um, this wet dry wet dry wet dry created fermentation in that seed head in that blanket, but it wasn't enough ferment it wasn't enough fermentation to make it rot or make it mold. It was just a very gentle fermentation. And during that time, the the physical process of the seed head started to loosen, loosen from its, you know, fr from its um, moorings, you know, where it's it, it's it's in a little uh, cup, all right, it's in a little cup on the on the end of the grain, and so all of those fibers, all those anchors, and the you know the anchor bolts uh, start to start to degenerate during this uh, during this period of time. After a period of time, then these shocks are gathered and they're placed on a wagon again, very gently because you didn't, because by this time things are starting to get really loose, put it on a wagon gently. And then you would take it to a, a place where you could thresh it. And so threshing was simply, it was done many, many different ways throughout history. Uh, it was done sometimes with animals that we, so you'd put in a big pile and have animals walk over it. Uh, the Bible talks about don't muzzle the ox that treads the corn. Uh, corn was ubiquitous for all grains. It wasn't just you know corn corn. It was it was everything from millet to you know to wheat to barley to whatever. And and so they would they would walk the animals over it, and the animals then would just 
uh, with their hoof action, they would step on it and and uh, and and tear it up, so that then you could pick up the leftover uh, stalks, and you go into a like a breezeway or something, and you fling this in the air, and the wind blows through and blows the chaff, the which is so so the seed heads are heavy. Seed heads are, you know, they're like little marbles, okay? Little marbles, they're heavy. And so the wind, a breeze, doesn't blow them away, but it does blow the chaff away. Just like if you, you know, if it's a breezy day, you reach down and you, you pick up a, a handful of grass, you fling it in the air, it doesn't take much of a breeze for that handful of grass to blow away. That's the chaff, it's blowing away. And so, uh, and, and other, other times, uh, people would beat, if they didn't have animals or something, they would beat the stalks with a flail. That's where we have flailing about, and you just beat this pile of, you know, pile of grain uh, uh, with a flail. In other words, it was all about how trying to beat this to loosen, loosen the seed head out of its little cup holder at the end of the plant. You know, just a little side note that George Washington, right, actually invented that sixteen-sided treading barn. And he used it yes. for threshing, yes. right? To process the wheat. Yes. So that's exactly what you're yes. talking about. And George Washington did that. Yeah, he absolutely did. And, and, and so obviously to do that, you needed some sort of a of a hard floor. You didn't want to do this on the mud. <laughs> you know, you'd you lose everything down in the mud. So you wanted something that was either some sort of a plaster, uh, uh hard packed uh cobblestone, even, you know, rocks. Uh, they lay limestone but some sort of a, uh, you know, a hard floor. And these, by the way, see, you know, you know, these, these threshing floors have been discovered um, all over the world in what is today deserts. And, and so we know, uh, we know that these old deserts used to be grain fields, um, you know, back long time ago. And, and because um, we found the, we found the big, you know, the big threshing floors. Um, so, so what what you're doing here is you're trying to dislodge the seed head now from its from its husk and from its kind of its blossom blossom it, it, it's uh, its cup its its little moorings, and so you separate it, you you beat it, you thresh it, and then you you winnow. So I'm I'm using old words, you know, that we don't use much anymore, but I hope they give you some, you know, some historical perspective. When you say flailing about, you know, everybody turned their kids loose. They turn, you know, you had these these sticks that were sometimes you'd have a, a, a rudimentary hinge on them, and everybody's just out there beating this stuff to death. So we say when you're flailing about, it's kind of it looks it looks uh, completely, um, you know, spontaneous and crazy, but everybody's just you know, beating these seeds out of the, out of the grain crops. And then when you winnow, you, 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 you fling all this uh, leftover up in the breeze, the breeze blows away the chaff and the grain, the heavy little grain marbles fall to the floor. That was the, the point. Of, and then you'd gather those up and you'd put them in some sort of a vessel, a, you know, a, a clay pot or, or whatever. Here's the point I'm making. Not until extremely recent days, literally not until the 1940s, were people ever able to eat grain that hadn't gone through a, a light fermentation process. Now, Cena can probably give us a little information of what the, the, the fermentation process does. But today, today, all of that that I described has get, been compressed into a reciprocating knife, like a hedge trimmer. Now, some they're, they're great big. Some of them are, you know, 30 feet wide. You know, you see these great big combines. Um, and and the, the whole plant comes into a, um, a, a combine, which has beaters that beat the heads, fans that blow the chaff back out on the field and the grain then falls into a conveyor 
which which augers it then into a hopper on the combine. Thank you for joining us on Beyond Labels. Our mission with this podcast is to make it accessible to everyone. But we are behind a paywall because the issues we discuss are often subject to censorship. We run into that and so we have an extremely modest paywall to let us have the freedom to discuss the kind of issues we want to discuss in the way we want to discuss them. And you can become a member and enjoy all this content by clicking on the description box below. We look forward to having you join our family.